Today's podcast sponsor is Hubert Engineered Woods. And I want to talk to you about zip sheathing and why we use zip sheathing. I know you've heard me talk about it on the podcast before, but I thought let's just lay it out in the simplest of forms. Number one, when I install it properly, I tape the seams, I liquid flash the seams, I manage for water with my windows, I do, I, I use their products, I don't have to worry about water. There are times when we install drywall inside of a house and we don't have cladding on the outside because a no zip system is going to be waterproof. So that's number one. Number two, I can manage for air. So using zip system sheathing on the walls, my like last five houses we built were all below passive house uh, levels of air leakage. They were all below that 0.6 ACH 50. And we're not putting that much effort into air sealing. We're just making sure that we tape well, which we manage for water, we manage for air. And the last five houses that I've built all had zip bar because that continuous insulation that comes adhered to the back of my zip sheathing that I'm already putting up and installing, now I have continuous R value that I get the whole R6 or the R9 or R12, whatever it is, I don't see building any other way. It works for us. It can work for you. Make sure you go to huberwood.com and check them out. And Huber, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Pete Yost here for the Unbuild It podcast. I'm here with my fellow podcaster, Steve Bazek. Hello, Unbuild It podcast. And Jake Bruton. I'm just going to say hello like a normal person. Well, I appreciate okay. that. So you're tuned in today to hear about the challenges that are faced to build high-performance homes for insulation contractors and HVAC contractors. And I was the one who initiated this topic because I think those are the two that are particularly challenging for both, well, for all of us, for uh, those focused on the building science of building. You've never seen a one-arm paper hanger. Um, no, I have challenges. not seen a one-arm paper Just hanger. Saying. How did you know that? How yes. did you know that that was the case? Have you seen a one-arm paper yeah. hanger? Yep. Yeah. You talk about challenges. Okay. But anyway, sorry. Is it okay if I just stick yeah. with insulation and HVAC? I didn't mean to interrupt, but yes, you did. To throw it out there. So why why do you think those two particular contractors face particular challenges? Well, I'd start with it's the same challenge that every builder and subcontractor faces when the high performance thing comes to their market. Hmm. They've never done it before. They don't know what they're supposed to be looking for, and they're not interested in changing. How Steve, am I going to bill for that? <laughs> I mean, the HVAC contractor, it's one of the few mechanical pieces in the house, right? So it's an active participant, not a passive participant. So the insulation guy, he kind of gets off because if he does a bad job, you just have a slightly inefficient insulation system. If the HVAC guy does something wrong, like crimp a pipe or something, you can effectively not have the comfort you're desired. So it's pretty pretty easy to identify their deficiencies. So let's when start the house with gets commissioned. Just HVAC guys. And then and we'll split them up. I think that yeah. works a little nicer because they have different problems. So I the reason I picked these two contractors, but let's start with HVAC for me is that um, it's the one area where we have really increased the complexity of the systems we use. And I hear comments all the time from affordable projects all the way up through high performance projects that while the equipment's gotten a lot more sophisticated, the folks installing them have not, um, or specking it. And interestingly, when we were trying to do high performance under building America back in 2000, what was the contractor that stood out as the toughest to get lined up? to deal with the higher performance homes we're building in America. Yeah, it was HVAC. It was HVAC contractors. So we did uh, the Hilltop house. We used Mitsubishi equipment in that house. It's all heat pump stuff, uh, too many splits in a ducted unit. And uh, we had an HVAC designer, an engineer, design the system. And then because we knew that we were going to film it and people were going to see it, we sent the information to Mitsubishi a contact there and said, Hey, this is what our HVAC des- designer is specking. Interesting. What do you think? And they went, This is ridiculous. There's no way that the house needs that much 
cooling. Yeah. I know that wow. it's got windows, but it's triple. And they redesigned it and cut the system in half. So you and, had an engineer do it, a mechanical yeah. engineer. And the wow. and, and somebody that we respect, somebody that's worked with our houses before, somebody that did the design for my house and this studio and all these things. And they just missed the mark and they I mean, were that's panicked. Pretty, that's pretty typical. They were panicked. I mean, and, I, that that house up in Windsor, it's, uh, you know, 1480 or something like that, just under 1,500 square feet. We were designing it. Homeowner, <coughs> excuse me, sends it out to the HVAC guy, comes back, and he's got, like, I don't know, four mini split systems in this house. Or, <laughs> and and he has a load of, like, 60,000 BTUs or some crazy number. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. the homeowner... First of all, you know, gets me that and goes, Steve, we paid all this money to design this really efficient house, and this this doesn't seem like efficient. I said, no, that number should be like fifteen. When your 16. homeowner says that, that's not yeah. a particularly good. Well, sign. He's, he's well versed, and mm-hmm. and I'm like, no, that number should be down sub fifteen. Yeah, or whatever. They had the twenty six hundred square foot hilltop house at like twenty five or thirty thousand, uh, thirty five thousand. Sorry. Uh, yeah. BTUs and when Mitsubishi Just, came back, they were like, "We don't design equipment, but we think your load's probably somewhere around like nineteen thousand BTUs." Yeah. So, what are the tools available for either the engineer or the contractor to make sure that the system? And we're talking well, one ton, all, two ton, three ton, four. Yeah. <laughs> right. For those of you just listening, Steve did the HVAC guy standing across the street. He holds his hand at arm's length. If you can cover the house with two fingers, it's a two-ton unit. If you can cover it with three, it's a three-ton unit. I mean, we yeah. have the tools, and this is what I generally cite is the ACA manuals. That's the Air Conditioning Contractors of America. And there's the Manual J for the total loads of the building. There's a Manual S for sizing the system. There's a Manual D for the duct distribution and those are excellent standards, and you can invoke them. But you can screw those up. That, well, that's well, it's garbage the, in, garbage out, right? Yeah, that's well, true so of any calculation with, without an HVAC designer on the project, and we just let one of our previous HVAC crews do the calculations. Like the first time they came back to me on the Prairie House, I was like, "Yeah, but can I see the manual, Jay? Because that seems like a lot." And he's like, "Yeah, I'll email it to you." And I said, "Okay, you have double glazed windows." We're not using double glazed yeah. windows. Like the whole yeah, thing is that? garbage after that. Yeah. You have the plans. Well, the other one know. too that is hard to calculate in there that I'm told anyway is the effective air leakage, right? Because a lot of those programs just have it as like excellent, good, and you know, average or something. There's no way to like dial in a well, 0.5 or something. And so when they, when it, when the manual J does give you the option to, to punch in a number that previous HVAC contractor would always put in three. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, but it's not going to be three. And he goes, well, we don't know that until it's done. I was yeah. like, okay, we built six houses in the we last know it's four be years. Better than one. Yeah. We know that we yeah. for sure. Six houses in the last five years. One of them didn't meet passive house standards. Right. Like, yeah, better not have been mine. Can we just? It wasn't good, but it was the one that you and I wrote the article about. There you go. <laughs> so at least we can agree that we do have these tools, and they should be used. And if they're used properly, you get that a lot makes closer a big to design the system. Um, but we have a new ACA manual called LLH, which is the low load homes, Ooh. and that that is in response to that the tools that we currently have JS and D need to be further honed if you have a really low load home. Um, And one of the things that's coming out as a result of that is that you increase the shoulder seasons. Now you may need whole house dehumidification because you're not relying upon either the heating or the cooling system to do incidental dehumidification. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting here on a mild day and we have really efficient systems and we're recording the humidity behind us at 68%. And why is that? Because this is a low load home and we don't have, do you have whole house dehumidification? There's a lot of hot air again thrown around here. It's not hot air. It's humid air, my well, friend. Hot, moist air getting yeah. tossed around here. How's that? What is the, uh, it's, it comes into play with uh, 62.2, the amount of liquid that we exhale every hour. Isn't it like a liter of water or something like that? 
it's funny. I looked this up um, and got it from my brother, Nathan, who's a pulmonary doctor. And of course, he knows all about expiration rates and so on. Um, I, th- I think it's like over an eight hour period, an adult generates <clears throat> like a liter of water. And um, I was doing this because they asked me to come and do building science for tiny houses. And so I brought in a, a, a cup of water, a pint of water and a quart of water. And I said, which one of those represents how much moisture will be released by a dog and an adult inside a tiny house in eight hours? And I never got invited back to the tiny house thing again. <laughs> I have no idea why, because it was fascinating. I have some clues. Also, that rate has to be a lot less if my wife's mad at me. Because if she doesn't talk, she's not expelling the same amount of... I've been practicing Do, this. do your spouses listen to the podcast? Not, because we've covered this. I've been this practicing, is a safe space. <laughs> I've been practicing never this ancient it. Japanese breathing technique to become more efficient in my breathing and moisture. How's that oh, going? It's very good. Very yeah. good. It's working out really well. Um, that, I'm... I don't believe you, but I, if it's true, I'm really impressed. It was clever. So we, we do know that the, the better the job we do with the enclosure, the more honed our mechanical systems need to be. Yep. And that's the loads, the sizing, and the duct distribution. And I remember one of the first really cool times I gained respect for Steve. It's wow. happened not very often, but the first time was watching him work with Coda, sending the plans back and forth for where the ducts were going to go. And I, I had no idea that the size of the duct mattered, the run mattered, um, and you could actually calculate the supply and return needed if you knew the loads involved with the building. Did you know the time of day or the day of the week mattered? The I, day of the week. I know. So here's because one. whether or not everybody's here's, home. Here, or, no, here's one of my stories. I'm up in um, Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Yeah. Centex Homes with uh, I think it was Ed Von Toma. Uh huh. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And and we were talking about framing, advanced framing, and and HVAC high performance and such. And he goes, Steve, you don't understand. We got to start our installs for HVAC on Tuesdays. And I said, really? You start them on Tuesdays? He goes, yeah. And we hope that they're done by Thursday. And I said, really? He goes, well, fishing season. (laughs) Friday, (laughs) these guys are just racing to get out of here. And the the type of work you get on Friday is absolutely horrible by the HVAC contractor. Monday, all they're doing is sitting around, showing up late, talking about all their fishing stories from the past weekend. (laughs) And so you're not getting any good work there. So he goes, the only real productive days for an HVAC contractor in Eden Prairie is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. That's fantastic. So you have them do silly work on Mondays and Fridays and concentrate on the good work in the middle of the week. Wow. That, that's, that's the same. Constraint. When I talk to him, every time I talk to my plumber and I'm like, what are you doing? How's the boat? <laughs> like, I don't know any plumber that doesn't own a boat. HVAC guys are fishermen, apparently. Yeah. Well, they deal with liquids. You know, they have to cover all the bases. <laughs> All right. So the other thing we haven't talked about in terms of sort of more sophisticated needs from HVC contractors are whole house mechanical ventilation systems, because that's in my neck of the woods. That is just as problematic as the base conditioning systems. Yep. I think, you know, I I think part of it is it's, it's always this game of expectations, too. Like a lot of times I'll do a walkthrough like we do walkthroughs with electricians and we talk about where the lights and switches go. A lot of times, it, if it's a a project that warrants exactness, if you will, mm-hmm. we'll do a walkthrough with the HVAC contractor just to make sure, like, because they they'll have a window at in centered in the in a wall, and then for some reason, it's the registers a joist bay over mm. from center, and it's like, oh well, that's what they showed on the plan in the basement. And it's like, well, did you ever go upstairs to see? No, we just cut the hole from down below. And it's like, yeah, exactly. Trust so and verify. We need to do a little walkthrough to make sure, okay, this is in the right location. It's centered. And, and for it's more aesthetic purposes. Mm-hmm. But it is also when you do the walkthrough and you say, okay, so we're going from the trunk here. We got to get over to that corner. Mm-hmm. That And all of a sudden you're in the basement. There's these dropped LVLs and this yeah. way of how do you get there? Because we've all been in buildings where 
like they've crimped the pipe or tried to force it around this corner and it's totally useless. And I think it was it was definitely on a Building America project at Building Science Corporation where there was this incredibly frustrated HVAC contractor who was trying to get ducks through. Um, Which is every HVAC contractor. I was just going to say. And he turned to me and he said, do you know what my definition of non-structural is? And I said, no. He goes, anything in my fucking way. <laughs> yeah. Do we have to bleep that? I meant to say F and way. <laughs> Peter a, has a nasty mouth. That was mouth. a quote. Yeah, he that has was a potty quote. mouth. That was a quote. <laughs> just for the record, Peter was the first one to drop an F bomb on Builder Podcast. <laughs> Probably our <laughs> views are going to go way up. So no here's, the, here's the way that we handle this side of things. When we're doing something super important, we try to check what's going on before the, you know, the design. We have, and I know a lot of people will be like, oh, you're probably overpaying if you don't work with more than one HVAC guy. I trust my HVAC guy. I ask him what it's going to cost to do it right. He knows that we have one installer, shout out to Carl, for mini splits because he's the man in our community and he's been to the most trainings. He knows Fujitsu. He knows Mitsubishi. Like He knows how they operate. He's done as much as anybody else. And we have one crew that does duck work for us. And it's two guys. Shout out to Joseph and dang it, James. Uh, you know these guys well. And huh? they, uh, yes. And they, even when we used the Zender for the first time at the Hilltop house, I said, I want you guys to install this. And I know it wasn't part of your original scope of work, but I need those guys to do it because I want them to understand how to do it moving forward. So I just had a thought. <clears throat> If we have such an emphasis on control layers for the enclosure, what you just described is an awful lot of control for HVAC performance. Yeah. So if, if we have control layers that we're really fussy about for high performance buildings, sounds to me like we have to have the same level of control in yep. terms of performance of the HVAC. Hey, is yeah. that, that, and that's meant to be sort of a wrap up. So we can move on to insulation contracts. Yes. All right. I was going to give you guys a quiz, but now I'm not going to give it to you. Oh, no, okay. No. Uh, <laughs> fine. So you don't get that. It's a really so, cool quiz, too. Th- and the other thing is, I'm going to make you even a little angry because I have to, when I talk about insulation contractors, say that my pet peeve is you got to manage moisture and energy with equal intensity. And yes. so the problem is, yeah, that's why it didn't make you angry. It made you sleepy. Made me sleepy. Yeah, it's an angry sleep. Well, it's the an idea angry, is angry that sleep. if we're trying, if we have to manage both. And all they do is manage heat flow, that creates problems. And most of the time when we're talking about what, you know, what's kind of funny. We have weatherization contractors. No, you know, what's kind of funny. Have you ever seen the guys that come out of the back of an insulation truck? (laughs) Now that is funny. Okay. No, and I'm not saying they're funny, but I'm saying matching up the guys that come out of the back of the insulation truck with managing heat and moisture with equal (laughs) intensity (laughs) and trying to get them to believe and understand and be on the same page with that concept i find amusing well i totally agree with you and we're going to come back to that but i just want to say weatherization i mean weatherization means that you should be controlling moisture and energy because in the word weather right and yet one of the big problems has been that they come in and manage just the insulation or the heat flow, and then that creates moisture problems. Um, and mo- I, I work with two or three different insulation contractors in my neck of the woods, and they're bringing their game up. They're understanding that they either have to honor the moisture management that's required, and what's happened more and more is, they don't call me as often, but if they get to a situation where they're unsure, they'll, I've actually had them tell clients, you really need to have Peter come in and look at this because we won't well, insulate no. this until we're sure we have the moisture managed. So the opportunity for success, just as with HVAC insulation, it starts with good design. It yep. starts with an architectural design in place <clears throat> that's accurate and, and appropriate for the climate and the performance of the home. And I would tag on our scope of work. So, like, even though you give us, Steve, you give us the most uh, well-executed and well-documented plans that we work with from any architect, it also doesn't say that there's a vent chute in every bay in the attic when we're doing a vented attic. But my scope of work says that. And the code calls for, like, one in every three. 
or it, oh, it calls oh, really? for balanced. So oh, the same at the eaves as up top, and right. that, that equates to about one of every, every three. Oh, so if that's not in there, our insulators will show up and go, well, that wasn't part of our bid. We're not putting shoots in every single one. We bid every, every third. And so like that's a simple, somebody has to be paying attention. Somebody has to note these things to begin with so that they know what they're going to do when they get there. I might and, have to write each bay on my little note for you should. the AccuVent. So... The special case for me for insulation contractors, too, is my, my first research project at the NH Bay Research Center was Isonine, which was a brand new spray, spray insulation back in 1990. Who's the guy that invented that? We met him. Have you ever met him? Uh, Graham was his, Graham, what was his last name? But, but then there was the... You're thinking of the telephone. Peter, <laughs> Peter also remembers the telephone being yeah, invented. Yeah, I don't remember it being Graham. Shoot, no, the, I, the, the head the chemist... Canadian dude. Who's the Canadian dude, Joe's buddy? Yeah, Graham Kirkland or something like no, that. But, but he had a he fine. had an Eastern European guy who was his chemist that I did a lot of work with. And I just I'm remember going to a shoot. Brazilian steakhouse in Vegas with him. No, oh. <laughs> sorry, I'm not. Somehow, I'm not surprised. Steve took it back to a meal. Yeah, took it back to a meal. But uh, the um, the key thing was, I thought, oh, for the first time, we have an insulation where the quality of the installation doesn't matter, right? Because it goes and fills all the nook and cranny. A lot like ice cream, by the way. It just it fills, fills all, all the nooks, nooks and, and crannies. crannies. But it doesn't. Because if you doesn't. cut a cross-section of isonine, it doesn't fill all the... Well, it creates nooks and crannies. So the, the quality has shifted from the quality of the... sort of the craftsmanship of the insulation to the quality of the chemical reaction management. Right, yeah, which means the equipment and the fiddly. Yeah, and and insulation manufacturers don't uh, they don't make insulation; they make ingredients. If it's spray foam, the the chemical companies are selling the ingredients. The manufacturing of the product happens at the job yeah. site with the hot and sweaty guy that's wearing the mask and the monkey suit and everything. So when we talk about control, um, I tell my insulation contractors two things. One is um, you have to be certified at the company level, third party, and at the installation level by either uh, ABBA, the Air Barrier, I'm sorry, ABAA, the Air Barrier Association of I America. I banned in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. That was my mistake to say Did ABBA. Did they come out of movie Mamma Mia or something? ABAA, yeah. Air Barrier Association of America, <laughs> oh, or the yeah. SPFA, the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. They both oh, have third those party. Those are a riveting bunch, by the they way. They are. I partied with them before. I, You know, I'm, I'm looking at the camera now. <laughs> <laughs> they both have third party certification programs. And in Canada, it's required that you be certified. In the United States, it's recommended. And then the second thing is, I can't understand why we're not doing uh, blower door performance test requirements, you know, open cavity or before you close up. Prior, those, prior to wall board. Prior to wall board to make sure you I got am. it right. Me too. Cool. But I'm not surprised that you guys are on the top of your game when it comes to this topic. So after design, it comes down to execution again, same as with HVAC, and it comes down to supervision. And performance-based verification. I don't Do you remember like the trust but verify? Do you remember the uh, yeah. Owens Corning complete the we're going to caulk every joint on the inside oh, of the house was that, that they came uh, out with? Yeah. Well, so there was an eco seal system by yep. Knopf, I think. Yep. And then was it Certainty that had the? No, I think it was, it was Owens, Owens, Corning, Owens Corning, Corning complete is what they complete called it. Complete system, yeah. And so we had a couple years of trying to get to the site at the exact moment that they were thinking that they were going to start doing that. Oh, interesting. And even one time, uh, Pat, our favorite ins installer now, he was working on it, and I was like, okay, Pat, so number one, if this is going to work, we have to do it everywhere. He was like, well, I have done it everywhere. I was like, okay, well, what about this joint in this header? What about this joint in this header? Yeah. What about where the header connects to the jack? Like, And so it was like a... Let's talk about why this system is flawed and from an install. And then I said, okay, and we don't want this because you're trying to create an air barrier and the green wall board that's on the outside of the wall is our air barrier. So all I want you to do is the inside. Mm. Like, I just want you to insulate, not, not yeah, do this let's caulking not product. 500 feet of joints. Let's caulk 3,000 feet of joints. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, 
this is like, I need you to only focus on insulation. You're not air sealing anything on this house. And that took three houses of showing up at the right moment and going, please don't get that out of the truck. Please put that back in the truck. We're not Such doing bully. that. But so it's know. interesting because we're talking about control layers at the design level and then translation to job site details and then verification with something that, I mean, I remember the first time I did a blower door test on insulation I had installed. I was so freaking angry because I was the one that done it. And well, I, I didn't. an angry person. It doesn't take much. And I'm getting angry is by the, the word that comes because to mind. of, you know, comments like, I know you're my podcast buddy, but. I'm just. Well, yeah, I call <laughs> but it it's good. I, I think to get angry about insulation is a good thing. Because um, what does insulation do? It makes things more heated. And so, so should our conversations wow. be insulated? He got there <coughs> quicker than I would have thought. He did get a peach oak in. Unbelievable. <laughs> Even as bad as it is. But so I did choose to single these two contractors out. Do you think there is another key contractor that is? For us, it's our framers because Ooh, they're in charge of so much of the air sealing, detailing, and window installation. There's a lot of hand holding there. There's a lot of like, hey, Let's step back. Let's look at this. Let's make sure that we're continually saying the word continuous in our head when it, when we talk about our air barrier, things like that. And is that because you use a system generally that's an exterior air seal? Yeah. That's part of the sheet. Yeah. Yeah. The zip system. Yeah. Which I, uh, I had a moment of pride the other day. I had uh, our HERS Raider, uh, after they tested my personal house that we were really happy to score, said, oh, we did have, we finally tested another one that was... Uh, like below one and a half ACH 50. And I was like, Oh yeah, who? And he told me the builder and he said, yeah, they did a really good job. And I was like, yep. His framer is my framer. And he took our details there. And without my supervision, it was three times as leaky as wow. the houses that we're building. So I just, uh, at sort of a wrap up, want to give a shout out to, uh, Henri Fennell. He's the guy, uh, another Vermonter. I know who Iron Reese. Um, super spy? I had coffee with is him a, like three or four, four years like ago. Sounds like a super spy. Yeah, he sounds like a super spy. He's the godfather Henry. of spray foam insulation. Yeah, he's actually a trained architect, but uh, had an insulation company focusing on spray foam for a long time. He kept getting underbid by all the folks who weren't doing the right insulation mm-hmm. details. So he, he and I wrote an article together called Seven Tips to Getting foamed in place insulation correct and it was his seven points that he uses um that all spray foam jobs should comply to and uh you, that article is a free download off of buildinggreen.com do we have time for a story we, yes. we have time for a short story to wrap okay. up okay so i'll leave you with is this it, it ties directly into what you're just saying good good insulation is it also an insulators. anecdote no it's an anecdotal story um <laughs> So, working on this project, I tell the, the homeowner, I said, this is the insulator that I usually use. We get a price. It's like $38,000 to insulate the house. The uh, homeowner, on his own, gets another insulator, comes mm-hmm. back, and prices twenty one k, and says, Steve, I have a really hard time paying $17,000 more just to use your guy. And I said, I, I don't have any allegiance to them. I mean, I, I like them. They do a good job. As long as this guy is going to do the same job. Before we award it, let me just go back. Let's go back to my insulator. And he goes back and says, Steve, I can, I probably can't buy the material for, for, that, for price. that price. And I said, all right. He goes, it's, it's all right. So we go with the 21K guy. So he installs it. Homeowner says, you know, maybe you want to come by and just check it out. So I do. And in the basement, which was probably close to 3,000 feet, we had two inches of closed cell on the wall. So I got out a coat hanger, four inches long, stuck it in, pulled it out, measured it, inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter, Mm -hmm. inch and a half. Inch and a half was probably the highest. It averaged around. So they paid for two. We paid for two. So we called the guy and said... You know, I painted, I had a green can with me, so I painted green wherever I measured it and said, and you could stand in there and it's just green stripes everywhere. everywhere. It's like a zebra, green zebra. And the insulator, the guy in charge of the insulation company came and said, you know, I said, everywhere there's a green stripe, we're less than two inches. It's pretty much everything. All right, we'll have the guys come. I ran my hand across the top 
They sprayed the wall. They sprayed from down below the band joist, but the band joist never connected to the wall. They never went like that. They never, pointing that whole down. top of the foundation wall to mud sill, wide open. Go upstairs. Key, key to the air seal, yeah. We go upstairs, and basically two by tens, we're supposed to get nine inches of spray foam. Almost every rafter, I can see the side of it. And so mm -hmm. I tell the insulation guy, I said, hey, if we call for it to be full, I shouldn't be able to see the side of the rafter. And I, I said, it's not rocket science to like see that one, right? I can see the foundation wall, even though you guys should be checking it. But this is a visual inspection, right? Right. right? It's flush to the thing. No. Nope. So they came back five times. Like the fifth time, the guy's dropping F-bombs at me. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. This is your scope of work. You wrote it. Yeah. You said and you were going to deliver this. And there's a 17K difference. I'm losing money and this and that. That's not my fault. It's right. not my fault. This right. is the scope of work that you provided and said you were going to put in. Not me. You. No. You wrote that. And it's it's one of those things where spray foam, it's real easy. And that's how these guys are able to get these jobs because nobody checks them. Yeah. And they just go in and they probably did make money the first on day time. one if they were able to just drive away and not have to return. Yeah. So the wrap up here is that we need control freaks for both insulation uh, uh, trade contractors and HVAC. So. Uh, which, which is, is going to tie in nicely to the next podcast. So make sure you turn in, tune into the Ooh. next podcast. Hey, do, do, do we have another one? Yeah. Okay, good. Cool. I'm not Go giving ahead. away what it is, but listen to the next right. one. So Wait, that's a Were wrap. you guys planning on quitting? Is this the last one and I didn't know it? No. I was just wondering. If <laughs> we, we, we I feel like I should know channel. if you're no. quitting. For the, for those of you that are watching our podcast right now, we, we're planning to do another 4,648, I believe, right now we're contracting we for. So. And, and I'm the guy with the white beard who says there's not going to be 4,600 more. 48. 48. 4,648. So that's a wrap from the Unbuild It podcast. Make sure that you click on those silly little buttons you're supposed to, to subscribe and like and all the other crap that you have to do related to social media. and Tell a um, friend, too. Tell a, yeah, just tell a friend. That's the main tell thing. Tell two friends. And ask them to tell two friends. Because several of us have more than two friends. Some of us. Yeah, Thanks for tuning in. I have in. no friend, so if you need a friend. <laughs> that ended way sadder than it should have. Have a good day. <laughs>